I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Frere Alam for his kind invitation, as well as Dr. Mary Khoury. Uh, okay, uh, you, you, I mean, let us make it clear, you can interrupt me at any point, if there are questions, if there are things, just would like me to go back so we can stop. The presentation will last around 30 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers, making things much easier and, more, I mean, more, it gives it, it makes it more lively than just presenting slides. Uh, as for the title, I mean, I, I was hesitant in the beginning. Shall I start? I mean, someone would think about anxiety and stoicism. And as you know, blessed are stoic people. I mean, someone who's stoic is someone who's blessed. Unfortunately, the majority, we are more on the anxious side. And the second title could be, are we warriors or warriors? Est-ce qu'on est des inquiets ou des guerriers? Et this, this is how things go. There are people who are labeled as warriors, fighters, and there are people who are worried, who are labeled as anxious or who worry easily. So this is just a picture of the village where I come from. It's a small, rather small village in the mountain called Beit Shabeb. It's a very nice village. You can visit it. It's a very calm village. So this is our agenda. I'll introduce the topic in the beginning. What is anxiety? Define some technical words. And then a very important question. Why do bad genes stay in the pool? I mean, why the bad genes that code for diseases would stay? Why do they persist? Why they don't disappear? Because eventually a bad gene would kill someone. If it kills someone, how come it persists in the pool and we keep on having those diseases? And then define an enki compared to a guerrier, a warrior compared to a warrior. And finally, I mean, the, the, the philosophers from the antiquity, we owe them a lot. A lot of what we know currently about anxiety, about cognitions, about cognitive therapy, we owe it to philosophers from back in the anti antiquity. Some of the slides I'm going to go quickly because no need to spend a lot of time. They're very technical. So the other slides will spend more time. So I'm sharing with you a movie now, a very short movie. Uh, it's in French. So if you have questions, you just interrupt me. Just, just to introduce the topic. Most of you, I guess, know this, have watched this movie. This is short, the trailer. And the title, Elle donne des ailes. Qu'est-ce qui donne des ailes? L'expression, il y a une expression, elle donne des ailes. There is an expression, pardon? La peur. La peur, voilà. La peur donne des ailes. Okay, so let me share with you those that all of us, hein? When, quand on a peur, on a des ailes. Donc on est tous comme ça, bon. Sauf quelques guerriers. Le champion est réveillé! Ah le champion! 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 Fais-nous peur! Pardon? Fais-nous peur! Nous sommes venus de très loin pour connaître la peur. J'exige que tu nous apprennes ce que c'est. Euh, la peur euh, La peur, c'est... Euh, euh, comment dire La peur... Euh, on tremble, on transpire, euh, on claque des dents. Euh, parfois, on a mal au ventre aussi. C'est la grippe. La peur, c'est la grippe pas Comment ça t'attrape, ça Moi, c'est en faisant la bise à ma cousine épitaphe que je l'ai attrapé. Oh. Tu t'obstines à ne pas vouloir nous livrer ton secret, hein, Gaulois Mais si, mais, mais si, je vous jure là... Et si on les découpait en morceaux pour voir dans ses entrailles où se cache la peur hein Oui. Ouvrons-le Oui, ouvrons-le 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 Ça suffit. La plaisanterie a assez duré, qu'on le réveille, qu'on l'emmène sur le bord de la falaise. Il va nous faire une petite démonstration de vol. Ok, 
So this is just to introduce the topic and to highlight how important is fear in our life. When it gets to defining a disease, defining someone who's sick, it's usually easy, rather easy. There are blood tests, there are brain imagery, body imagery, so it's easy to define what's a disease. However, what is more difficult is how can we define someone in good health? Back in the 40s, the, the World Health Organization defined being in good health, not only physical, but also mental and social well-being. So it's a triad where the body should be fine, the soul should be fine, and the social functioning should be fine. So yes, it's easy to define a disease, but it's not easy to define what is being in good health. Okay, these are words that we usually use interchangeably. But as a matter of fact, they are not synonyms. I mean, anxiety is something, fear is something else, and finally, worry is something else. I will try to translate them in French. Anxiety would be l'anxiété, l'angoisse, fear would be peur, and worry would be inquietude. How to distinguish them? When it gets to anxiety, it's an apprehension of uncertainty while we're anticipating something that might be threatening or not threatening, and this will lead to impaired cognitive functioning, mental functioning, and will impair even physical symptoms. This is anxiety. Whereas fear, it is an emotional response to something real. I mean, it is something that is going to happen imminently. We perceive it as something threatening. So fear is different from anxiety. Let me make it simple. We're going to go for examples. Anxiety. For instance, I could be anxious. How will the presentation go? I would be worried before coming, thinking about it. How will it go? This is a simple example of anxiety. What will be an example of fear? Something really threatening, something really dangerous, and that is imminent. I'm going to ask the gentleman in the, I mean, going to ask the gentleman in the audience, what would, could you share with me an example of fear? Earthquake. This is an answer given by a lady. She would express fear because of a earthquake. The gentleman, can you give him an example of fear? For instance, you're driving back home. It's 7 p.m. You're about to get home, and you just remember that today was the birthday of your marriage. And you forgot about it. And you're arriving home, and your wife is waiting. You didn't call her in the morning. You forget about the roses. You forget about the gift. You're dead. So this is fear. This is not anxiety. This is. Exactly. So we avoid going home. This is one of the reactions when it gets to fear. Either we fight it or we flee. So you avoid going home because def definitely this is a true threat. So this is the difference between anxiety and fear. Whereas worry, it refers only to those mental processes that we have in our mind when we talk about anxiety or we talk about fear. Now, if you want to deconstruct the syndrome, you can put it this way. I mean, we talk about panic attacks, les attaques de panique. This would go under fear, the same as phobias, and the same, then we go into worry. Someone who is apprehending something, a, a misery, a worry of misery. But what are the figures? What do we know worldwide? I mean, when it gets to anxiety, the figures are quite high. And let us make it clear, there is, different, there is a big difference between anxiety as a feeling and can be anxious while coming to the conference because I might miss something, I, might, I mean, I might not deliver appropriately the conference, and there is something called anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder became a disease where I need help. So, in the US, around 20% of the population have suffered from an anxiety disorder during the past year. Imagine, 
Imagine 20 percent. One person over five, not suffers from anxiety, suffers from an anxiety disorder over the past year. And over a lifetime, 30 percent of the American citizens have suffered from at least one anxiety disorder. So, for instance, let's say we're 100 in this room, 30 of us will suffer at least once in their lifetime of a true anxiety disorder. Not moments of worry or moments of anxiety. Okay, this is again the DSM-5. The DSM-5 is a book, it's a reference book that is used in psychiatry and psychology. It has its flows, it has its, I mean, it has its pitfalls, yet it is there to give a consensus, to give definitions that make, may help us talk the same language. So the DSM-5, with all its flows, has labeled different types of anxiety disorders, specific anxiety, specific phobia, for example, phobia from spiders, phobia from snakes, whatever. Social anxiety, people, we call them people who are shy, la phobie sociale. Generalized anxiety, panic, agoraphobia, post-traumatic stress, acute stress, for example, after the Beirut blast, so on and so forth. We will have, the most important one, the most common one, is something called generalized anxiety disorder. Trouble d'anxiété généralisée. Bitambahou bihmul ham. Kill el wa'at bihmul ham. This is what we call generalized, we label as generalized anxiety disorder. Someone who's a warrior, who worries constantly. Quelqu'un qui inquiète, inquiète en permanence. Tout l'inquiète, il anticipe tout. Avec, he anticipates anything to come with worry. So these are the symptoms of a generalized anxiety disorders. It is an excessive anxiety or worry in expecting something to come. And it, it is, we notice that there is restlessness, fatigue, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. And this hits a big chunk of the population. Why, why do you think there is fatigue? Whenever we're anxious, someone who suffers from an anxiety disorder, permanently anxious all of the time, most of the time, why would he be physically fatigued? Sorry? The mental health is influencing the body as a physical. Yes, because anxiety. Maybe because we will keep thinking all the time. Exactly. Energy, anxiety, worry, is energy consuming. You're tired by the end of the day because you're constantly dwelling on something you anticipate with worry. So you end up by being, being worried and tired and you can't sleep at night, okay? This is a common, this is the most common condition when we talk about anxiety. Okay, what is, the, the real prevalence is 12%. At least the 12% have a well-established diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. And the problem of generalized anxiety disorder, it doesn't come alone. Unfortunately, it doesn't come alone. It comes with other conditions and it leads to other conditions. And this, it makes it even more complicated. For instance, in depressed people, people have said depression, 16% would suffer from a generalized anxiety disorder. Whereas people who have anxiety, as a character, as a temperament, the coexistence of depression is 64%. Yani, two out of three anxious people would suffer from a major depression on top. And again, whenever you have generalized anxiety disorder, in around three quarter, you suffer from another anxiety disorder. Some specific phobia, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, they come on top of GAD. So, Generalized anxiety disorder is not as simple as it seems. This anxious temperament doesn't, isn't as simple as it seems. It, co it comes, it brings, it brings with it other conditions and other disorders. Okay, we talked about the brain. Is it a myth, is it a fallacy to say that anxious people have a higher prevalence of heart disease? Yes, definitely. And this is a beautiful study called Heart and Soul Study. If you look at the figures, they are quite scary. I mean, look at them. 
any car, any car unstable. Mind you, those are patients who suffer from heart disease and they are stable. They are well controlled. They're seeing their cardiologist, they are on their medications, they are stable. The fact that you're anxious, yani if you divide, let's say we have 100 individuals suffering from a heart disease, and the 100 are stable, they're doing well on their medications. And we split them into two groups. The group who have on top an anxiety disorder, and the group who doesn't have an anxiety disorder. Look at the difference in the probability of having a heart attack during the year to come. 9.6 compared to 6.6 which means having an anxiety disorder, to make it simple, having an anxiety disorder on top of our cardiovascular disease makes us 60% more prone to have a heart attack during the year to come, as compared to someone who is not anxious. Again, highlighting that generalized anxiety disorder doesn't come alone, unfortunately, it drags with her other conditions. Okay. Someone would say, where does anxiety come from? Okay, let me make it simple. Medicine is not a matter of genes only. Medicine is not a matter of environment only. La santé, c'est l'inné, la maladie, la santé, c'est l'inné et l'acquis. It's nature and nurture. Don't try to go and look for genes everywhere. And don't try always to highlight the environment. It's environment, is, it's both. It cannot be one. More than 90% of our diseases are nothing but a mixture of nature and nurture, genes and environment. So one of the topics which is currently in the world booming, if you look at religiosity, Really, you know what is religiosity? It's part of, nat of nurture. I mean, it's part of what we acquire in life, okay? So, religiosity seems to be lower. Yani anxious people seem to have a lower score in religiosity. We mean by religiosity, faith, practice, belief, etc., etc. And it doesn't seem to protect from depression in anxious people. We, we, we're going to highlight. This is a paper we published back in 2015. I'll give you more details in the coming few slides. What is GED? What is someone who, someone who suffers from generalized anxiety disorder or trouble d'anxiété généralisé? He is someone who has a debilitating condition. It's going to drag with it many other conditions. And it's a key player when it gets to cardiovascular diseases. How can we treat it? The guidelines are clear. Guidelines are clear when it gets to anxiety disorder. First step, psychotherapy. Don't start with medications. Psychotherapy, cognitive behavior psychotherapy, sorry, cognitive behavior therapy, psychodynamic therapy. Probability of obtaining, reaching, progress, in anxiety disorders with psychotherapy alone is up to 70%. <coughs> Except if it's comorbid with depression, which means, in other words, if the anxiety disorder has on top a depression, then you need psychotherapy and medications. If it's anxiety alone, pure anxiety, the guidelines are clear. You start with psychotherapy. It fails, you add antidepressants on top to psychotherapy. And this is, I like this sentence, if you worry, you die. If you don't worry, you die. So anyway, why worry? We're going to end up by dying. Quoi qu'il arrive, on sera plus là. Bon, ça n'a aucun sens de s'inquiéter. Okay, qu'est-ce qui est compliqué? What is complicated? What is difficult? And when it gets to make a difference between anxiety and depression, keep in mind, Anxious people are always in a hyperarousal state. Ils sont tout le temps sur le qui vive, always on the go, because they want to anticipate, want to make sure things are working. Whereas depressed people in depression, on est plus résigné. There is some type of resignation. We're not fighting anymore. Whereas an anxious person, always trying to find his way out. For example, 
the lady just told us, the gentleman who forgot the marriage birthday, she, she said, run away, don't go back home, find a way out, whereas a depressed person would just let go. Okay, is there an area of the brain where anxiety resides? Yes, we know. This is the part of the brain, it's called the amygdala, where anxiety is processed. On purpose, I'm sharing this slide with you to show you how the amygdala can be treated by psychotherapy. This is, this is a patient who had a simple phobia, phobia from spiders. And you can see the amygdala red firing. Phobia is not being scared. All of us are scared of, fibers, of spiders. We don't like spiders. However, a phobia is something really much more difficult than just a simple fear. So you can see that after treatment, the amygdala goes back to normal as it is with normal subjects. Okay, this is also another research we did a few years ago about the nature, the hormones that involved. There is a fallacy, there is a myth that oxytocin is the hormone of love. Wrong. Oxytocin is not, it's a fallacy. Oxytocin has nothing to do with love. Whereas oxytocin can protect from anxiety. And these are the figures about religiosity, I talk about Nature, nurture, and nurture, religiosity and religious interventions are protective from depression and from anxiety in more than 40% of the papers we went through. However, when it gets to GED, but it doesn't seem to be as effective when it gets to PTSD. When it gets to post-traumatic stress disorder, it is a bit less effective, whereas when it gets to panic and phobia, Religiosity doesn't seem to be protective. Okay, why do bad genes prevail? Do you have any idea why do bad genes prevail? Because logically, if a gene is bad, what does it mean a bad gene? Let's agree. A bad gene is a gene that codes for a disease which can kill. If disease or can make you sick. If this disease can make you sick, very sick, and eventually die, you won't mate often, you won't have children often. And with time, this gene should disappear because I'm dying because of this disease. Why would this gene stay? Sorry? No, no, I meant whether dominant or recessive. That's not the question. Because it's gonna kill, I mean, it's a bad gene. It's gonna code for a disease. And this disease will kill me either young or adolescent or early adult. And I may not have children, I may not mate and have children, so I will not, logically, I should not be in the, be, be, I mean, I mean, je ne transmet pas les gènes, I'm not transmitting the genes to future generations, yet they stay, those genes. Do you have any clue why? Okay, let me start with something anecdotal. Okay, this is the first answer, this is an anecdotal answer. It is not very wrong. Aristotle said, there is no way there should be creativity and genius without a strain of madness. And in Sweden, they did a very beautiful study, over 300,000 individuals. And what did they find? Of 300,000 psychiatric patients, patients who had a mental disease. In the group of the bipolar, they noticed that the siblings of the bipolar, les frères et sœurs des bipolaires, qui n'avaient pas la maladie, who didn't have the disease, they had a high percentage of creative and genius people, very intelligent people. So we start giving, having an idea that probably that, that those genes that code for bad things, at the same time, they may be coding for something good. So, Let's go back to anxiety. If I had zero anxiety, would I have prepared the conference of today? Would I have prepared my exams before sitting? Anxiety is a normal phenomenon. All of us should have some degree of anxiety to anticipate what to come and to be ready for exams, for my health, whatever it goes. Going to the airport, I mean, arriving on time to the airport, catching the flight, Anxiety is something good. It helps us move forward in life. However, when there is too much anxiety, it becomes bad. So, you start 
You still have, I mean, are you imagining an answer? Why genes coding for anxiety or bad things would stay? Let's look at the, com the coming slide. The body has adaptive reactions. When we cough and we vomit or when we have diarrhea, it's not bad. These are adaptive reactions from the body to help us survive. We get rid of the microbe by coughing, by vomiting, or by having the diarrhea. And the same anxiety, the smoke detector principle. Le, dé le principe du détecteur de fumée. Okay, the, the university administration decided that this room will have smoke detectors for fire. And they paid them, let's say $50,000. Ten years later, someone would come and say, what, what a silly decision. We invested $50,000 in a smoke detector and fire, I mean, no fire happened. Why did we invest all that money? Well, it's enough that it happens once and you save the whole building. So smoke detector, same thing with anxiety. For instance, let's say you're going to go on a vacation now, go for a one week vacation. If I suggest Sudan, would you go? Yes. Sudan. Not, no, Who said yes? Go You'll go now to Sudan. No, you're yeah, like, yeah, no. There is war. Well, of, well, of, sorry? <laughs> exactly. Well, okay. It's an adventure. This is the difference between an inquiet, an guerrier, an anxious, and someone who will fight it. So the smoke detector, I will not go to Sudan. Why? Because it helps me to survive. So being an anxious person, I will not go to Sudan. Whereas you, you're not anxious. You will go enjoy your vacation, come back, because the probability is one over 10,000 to be shot. So you enjoyed it. I was anxious, I stayed home. But this is not the only example. Let us look at the phobia of snakes and spiders. It helps you to survive. And the best example is the neurovascular reaction to loss of blood. Some people, when they see blood, they faint. Where does it come from? It's an evolutionary concept. C'est un, un, un principe de l'évolution. When there were wars, when someone was hit by a sword, he was bleeding and he fell, and then the army came to kill everyone. He used to mimic. He used to fake that he's dead. Why? To, be sur to survive, not to be killed. So this is something we learned from generation to generation, hundreds over thousands of years, that this is something that helps us to survive. So now there are people who see blood, who faint, because this is a neurovascular reaction. The bleeding will stop and someone else will not kill them because they think they are dead. So this goes back thousands of years to the antiquity, okay? So you can imagine now that some of the bad genes, some of the genes that code for anxiety will never leave us, will always be there because they will help us to survive. Okay, how to distinguish an Enki than Giri, a warrior from a warrior? There are many things, there are many things that make a difference between you and me, several things. I will only highlight just one simple thing. It's an enzyme, as simple as that. It's called the COMT, the catecho-O-methyltransferase enzyme. This enzyme has two variants, MET and VAL. Those who have the MET variant, they are born with the MET variant, they end up by being the warriors, those who are anxious, fearful. Those who have the VAL are those who will be the warriors and the fighters. Mind you, as we said in the beginning, it's not only a matter of genes. This is part of the, I mean, this explains in part why some people worry, some people fight, why some people are warriors, some people are warriors. So you can see, and this is on this side, this is the Val, and you can see the warrior, he's the fighter. He gets rid of dopamine very quickly from the brain, whereas the Met is the one who is fearful. He worries constantly. 
So most probably the lady has the val allele of the compt enzyme. It's a different type of enzyme, met and val. They two different types of the enzyme. It's a variant. So this is the movie. Sorry. Well, this is where it's not only, thank you for the question, why some people are sometimes warriors, sometimes warriors, parfois inquiet, parfois guerrier. Because it's not only, and thank you for asking the question, it's not only a matter of genes, it's not only a matter of met val. I gave this just to illustrate, it's part of the explanation, it's part of the answer. But nurture, life, education, upbringing, environment, relation to parents, religiosity, life experiences, I mean, they model the human brain. Our human brain is not, fortunately, is not only modeled by genes. It's modeled also by lucky nurture. I mean, what we go through in life. So this was the movie I shared with you. I mean, I guess most of you have read Asterix and Obelix, 1966. And the movie was, the movie was played in 2012, and you can see the difference between a warrior, someone who worries, and someone who is who fights. And La Peur Don des Ailes, the Vikings came over from very afar, from afar. They wanted to learn what is fear, because they are never fearful, they are warriors. Why? Because they wanted to fly. They wanted to learn to fly, how to fly. Parce que La Peur Don des Ailes, so they said to themselves, let's go and learn how to become fearful so we can fly. We only miss flying. Okay, uh, I'm going to finish just in two minutes and then answer questions. Uh, a lot of what we know today in, cognit in cognitive therapy and in psychology, we owe it to philosophers from the antiquity. And one of the most beautiful currents, and I always say it, blessed, blessed are Stoic people. People are Stoic, they are blessed. I mean, they, 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 they have the blessing from God. And Cicero, I mean, Cicero defined it, defined Stoicism, this philosophical current uh, mode of thinking, as not to express pain, to cope with pain, not to complain, to handle pain, and not to display, and be patient, and not to rush immediately into anxiety. And he, what he did, imagine, more than 2,000 years ago, he was able to distinguish between l'anxiété trait and l'anxiété état, state and trait, someone who's already from the beginning anxious, someone who's just today anxious. He did it 2,000 years ago, which is one of the basic concepts in, when it gets to psychology today, and one of the best, le plus beau plaidoyer, when he wrote, when he lost his daughter Tulia, and she died, and he wrote a letter to his daughter, and it was a plea for Stoicism. Le plus beau plaidoyer du Stoicisme. Okay, Seneca, also a Stoic philosopher, et là aussi, uh, here also, I mean, he said, we devote in cognitive therapy, we devote to the present, not the past, not the future. Our attention should be today, not tomorrow, not yesterday. Try to frame yesterday, tomorrow, and today in the present. And this is also one of those pillars when it gets to, to, uh, to mindfulness, which is one subvariant of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cognitive therapy. And this was a, a national study that we did more than 20 years ago. And we published the use of tranquilizers in Lebanon, not antidepressants. And I promise you, 9.6% is the highest figure worldwide. The use of tranquilizers, Lexotenil, Xanax, Valium, this family of medications, we have the highest figure worldwide, 9.6%, which is no European country or North American country reaches this, this figure. Okay, uh, okay, this is just what Nurture did. He became fearful, he became fearless fighter, and Nurture made him to become a fearful fighter, cross path, big blue. Thank you very much. I'm ready to answer any questions in French or in English what makes you comfortable.
français. You want, uh, I will say French, English, whatever. So, c'est quoi la différence entre être anxieuse, être stressée? C'est la même chose. En fait, le mot stress, c'est l'événement oui. qui déclenche l'anxiété. Le stress, j'ai le stress aujourd'hui de la conférence. Est-ce que ça va bien se passer? A priori, il y a aucune différence. C'est ah, le stress pas. qui amène l'anxiété. Je suis stressé par quelque chose. Et ça va ça. aboutir à être anxieuse. Voilà, j'exprime ça par de l'angoisse. Ah, ok. Merci. D'autres questions? From an evolutionary point of view, uh, the ancient human had this uh, flight or fight uh, attitude because uh, he was living in the jungle, lions, bears. So uh, he was always anxious and this anxiety used to peak and uh, he ran away, then he, he goes back to normal. Why today we, uh, it doesn't peak anymore, we are, it, it, it is high and always constant, like uh, always in a worry state. Uh, uh, why didn't, didn't it fade away with time since there are no lions anymore? Uh, and you know, we should adapt that there are no this, such as threats now, around okay, us. Okay, no, okay. Let's, let's make it clear. I, I fully agree. Back in, uh, I mean, hundreds of years ago and thousands of years ago, it was a matter of survival. To survive, either we flee or we, we fight. And yes, anxiety or fear was something, I mean, this is why I was saying, why do bad genes prevail? Because it helps us survive. Now, your question is why currently, since there are no lions, well, there are other circumstances today that could be even, I mean, more deleterious and more toxic than lions in everyday life. I mean, at least if you look at the frame of Lebanon, just look at the frame for the past three years, what you have went through. I mean, you, me, all those who are living in Lebanon since 2019 till today. I mean, if you look at them, I'm going to just very quickly make a very short vignette because human beings tend to forget, tend to forget how harsh things were. Let me remind you, let's start end of 2019. End of 2019, riots. People not letting you take your children to school, insulting you, blocking the streets. Okay, and I went through that. I wanted to drop my children to school. I want to reach my office. Yet, yet, there were rioters who were destroying everything. And this ended, what happened? Your, your currency. What happened? COVID. What happened then? Social distancing. The Beirut blast. And if, the, the earthquake. Look at those events, series of events, since October 2019. And this is, I mean, this is something that would create anxiety. I, I'm sure it is there. We're seeing it. Not a different type of anxiety as compared to lions, but it is there. If I may, one more question. Uh, regarding uh, the stoicism, uh, should one be like uh, active stoic, like to uh, do some effort in life and accept whatever it comes from life, or stay uh, like other philosophers, passive stoic, because uh, and does expectation in this matter uh, do have an impact on the well-being of the people? Okay. Thank you. Well, the question is very clear between active and passive stoicism. Of course, I fully agree. I mean, we have to go more into active stoicism. And this is where cognitive behavioral therapy comes in, CBT steps in. Yes, I agree. There is a distinction between active and passive, and we'd rather be on the active uh, spectrum to move forward, I mean, to keep on moving. Being that we have someone anxious in our life, so uh, I just want to ask if anxiety, uh, anxiety is uh, something contagious, you know, contagious, well, a lot. No, it's not. It's not something, I mean, it doesn't contaminate, it's only pas contagieux. Mm -hmm. If my sister, is anxious and I'm not, I'm not going to get contaminated. However, if we live together, it's going to be tiring. Yani, if I live with a person, and I'm not going to be able to do it, but I'm not going to be able to do it, because I'm going to be able to do it, and at one point, I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So it will not be contagious, but it's going to be energy consuming for me, because I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there always trying to be supportive, 
to listen, to try to steer him somewhere else constantly, more so if he suffers from a generalized anxiety disorder, which is a constant trend of life, trend of life full of anxiety. J'ai juste une question en français. Euh, il y a beaucoup d'anxiété actuellement au Liban, c'est-à-dire que les Libanais sont dans une situation d'anxiété généralisée ou pas. Est-ce que le taux de suicide élevé au Liban est en rapport avec cette anxiété ou pas Merci. OK, the question is uh, if 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 anxiety if suicide is in a way or another Really, currently in Lebanon, the rates of suicide are related to the rates of anxiety. Well, usually what promotes suicide are the depressive disorders more than the anxiety. It doesn't mean with anxiety we don't have suicidal attempts. Yes, it may happen, but usually the appropriate pattern is anxiety, depression on top, then we get more into suicide. So, l'angoisse, amener avec le temps et l'épuisement la dépression et quand nous avons ça c'est là où on passe plus à l'acte suicide ceci ne veut pas dire que l'anxiété en soi ne mène pas le suicide mais au demeurant c'est la dépression qui, qui est là pour amener plus le suicide que l'anxiété pure et simple uh, what does it look like to have uh, both uh, anxiety and depression Well, it's very, what does it, well, it's, it's something very common. I mean, as I said, it's usually they coexist, Yanni. When you have someone who has a generalized anxiety disorder, the probability of having a depression on top is around 65%. So they come together. And usually it's very common to have both at the same time. You have the cluster of symptoms of anxiety plus the symptoms of depression. And this is where usually it's a mainstay to consider medications plus psychotherapy. Whereas when it's only a matter of anxiety, as we said, we try to start with psychotherapy alone. It's worth it. Voilà. Uh, on utilise beaucoup le mot dépression. I'm depressed, uh, j'ai une dépression, yeah. parce as a doctor, uh, comment tu, tu, tu définis... Okay. Okay. This, this is an Ibanais. amazing question. I I'm depressed, I'm depression. But the word, the real word, depression, is what? I love this question. Thank you for asking the question. Sadness is not depression. La tristesse, c'est pas la dépression. Depression is a brain disease. Aujourd'hui, je suis triste parce que bah, j'ai appris qu'un de mes copains est malade. On m'appelle de l'hôpital. Le lendemain matin, en me disant, ben, il va beaucoup mieux. Ben, la tristesse, elle est partie. Par contre, si je suis en dépression, vous pouvez m'annoncer toutes les bonnes nouvelles du monde. Et I'm in depression, you can, I mean, you can come with the best news ever. I, I don't care. I won't react. I'm not, je, je ne suis pas réceptif aux événements positifs. Mon cerveau, ne, il est incapable incapable de faire la différence. Et il s'en fout carrément, il ne réagit pas. Par contre, quelqu'un de triste, annoncez-lui une bonne nouvelle maintenant. Oh, écoutez, c'est est fini la tristesse, elle est partie, elle s'en va. Par contre, dans la dépression, bah, vous pouvez tout faire pour lui. Bah, le cerveau, c'est fini, il, est, il, est, il ne réagira jamais aux bonnes nouvelles. Par exemple, une promotion, une guérison, une, une... ce que c'est. Oui, oui, et alors oui, alors, il continue à être misère, dans cette misère, dans ce misère, misérabilisme dans lequel il s'est enfoncé. Par contre, quelqu'un de triste, annoncez-lui une bonne nouvelle. Par exemple, annoncez-moi que je vais prendre trois semaines de vacances maintenant. Il n'y a plus de tristesse, je suis très content. De préférence. Mais je, il faut dire aussi que... Anna, je veux juste dire un, un petit constat. Vu tout ce qu'on a vécu les trois dernières années entre le Covid, soit la crise au Liban, la crise dans le monde et tout, c'est que cette, la nouvelle génération, les jeunes, les millennials, génération X, Y, Z, euh, franchement, avant, ils ne parlaient jamais de dépression, ni d'anxiété, ni de panic attack. Maintenant, je vois des, des petites jeunes minettes de 16, 17 ans, ils ont des panic attack, ils ont des panic attack, non, mais je pense que le monde 
euh, ou les, les réseaux sociaux, quand même, hein, ça a donné cette ouverture. Quel m'a bien acheté maintenant le panic attack À 16 ans, je peux dire d'après ce qu'on t'aurait dit comme ça, c'est d'après ce qu'on t'aurait dit. Oui, tout le monde génération, okay. d'après ça. Vous avez raison. Il y a, attention, il y a du bien, il y a du bon et du moins de bon. Ouais. Dans quel sens il y a du bon Mais dans quel sens il y a du bon Parce que c'est bien qu'il y ait une certaine awareness, une certaine prise de conscience que c'est des maladies, qu'éventuellement ça pourrait être des maladies et qu'on pourrait soigner, qu'on doit soigner comme on le voit pour les anxiétés et les maladies cardiaques. Le moins bon, c'est qu'en effet, tout devient... Oui, c'est pour ça, c'est là où l'éducation... C'est là où... C'est là où l'éducation... L'éducation joue un rôle d'amener la connaissance, la bonne éducation, de faire la dire, ok, génial, les réseaux sociaux aujourd'hui, la télévision, tout ça, ça c'est génial. Vous savez, mais n'en demeure pas moins, c'est quelque chose qui peut être mauvais, qui peut être mauvais parce que ça peut nous induire vers quelque chose, un excès. Mais en même temps, quand ça, moi je me souviens, j'étais gosse dans mon village, il y avait un type, j'avais peur de lui, parce qu'il marchait dans la rue tout seul devant notre maison, il parlait tout seul, il criait, il faisait un mouvement comme ça avec ses bras. Et moi, je ne comprenais pas de quoi il s'agit. Je ne savais pas, je me disais, c'est quoi ça Et en fait, c'est là où, quand il y a un minimum d'éducation, de connaissance, on sait qu'il y a une maladie, que ça peut être quelqu'un de malade, qui a besoin de soins. Mais en même temps, vulgariser trop, on tombe dans un autre excès. C'est là, probablement... Il faut être vraiment super vigilant, parce que ouais. le truc, il peut Allez, vraiment... C'est là où l'éducation... C'est là où l'éducation... Moi, j'ai mon fils... Euh, moi, j'ai mon fils, par exemple, il, est, il peut être anxieux parce qu'il a beaucoup d'examens. Je sais que, par exemple, le sport, euh, le, faire sortir l'anxiété par l'effort, donc il étudie une demi-page en arabe, il fait 25 push-ups. Il étudie 25 pages, il, il, étudie, il, il fait 25 push-ups. Et donc, c'est sa façon à lui aussi de sublimer l'anxiété. Le sport, c'est excellent pour ce qui est pour lutter contre l'anxiété. Mais attention, il y a une différence entre anxiété et trouble anxieux. Quand on est dans un trouble anxieux, on est plus on est dans, dans une maladie. maladie. Mais c'est normal qu'il soit anxieux pour. C'est normal qu'il soit inquiet. C'est normal qu'il soit inquiet pour son examen. Quoi de plus légitime C'est comme ça qu'il peut avancer. Okay, I want to stress on the previous question. Uh, someone having depression. Uh, so we know that he has a low energy, he doesn't have any energy for do anything, and he doesn't worry about anything in his life. At the same time, he has the anxiety. So the anxiety is overthinking and over uh, being worried about something. At the same time, have low, uh, have high energy. So uh, how can this well, match? When it gets, when it's comorbid with depression, it is energy consuming. And when he reaches the level of depression, he doesn't have any more the energy to fight. And that's why sometimes he goes for suicide. He resorts to suicide because he's completely so void he of energy. Just depressed. Exactly. He moved from anxiety into depression, and he has both now at the same time. And he has someone who has no more any resilience to fight back. Mm -hmm. And just let's go. And if it gets worse and worse and worse, unfortunately, sometimes. It might lead to, uh, to a suicidal attempt or, a, or unfortunately, a completed suicide. Thank you. Please. Can someone have a depression but at the same time live his life normally? If you go by the book, by the definition of the book, if you have clinical depression, which is a brain disease, definitely your functionality in life is altered. Functionality, you know, there are three, three domains in life, social, family, job, job or academics, depending on your age. So if you have clinical depression, where the brain is definitely sick, you cannot function. If you're still functioning, this means you did not reach yet, or you're on the way of going to major depression. It's another criteria to distinguish depression from, from just sadness. But if he's living a normal life, he's not yet into clinic. Most probably, he's not into clinical depression. He's still in a phase of sadness. And as the question was, how to distinguish sadness from depression? This, I would go more for something called rather sadness than clinical depression. Est-ce qu'il y a une relation entre les maladies chroniques et les panic attacks? 
entre les maladies. Les maladies chroniques et les panic attacks. Le, les maladies chroniques, vous voulez dire le cancer, les, le, cancer les, le diabète et tout ça. Oui, il faut savoir qu'avec les maladies chroniques, une chronic disease, il y a une comorbidité de dépression et de troubles anxieux. Pas nécessairement les attaques de panique, ça peut être tout. Mais oui, one of, un des facteurs de risque de développer une dépression ou de développer un trouble anxieux, c'est de souffrir d'une maladie chronique, quelle que soit la maladie chronique. Comment on peut supporter la personne qui, qui subit les panic attacks dans ces conditions-là Quelqu'un qui a une maladie chronique et qui a des panic attacks. Bah, déjà, s'il n'y a pas de dépression, la première chose à faire, c'est de demander à la personne d'aller commencer une psychothérapie cognitive comportementale ou éventuellement psychodynamique pour travailler la dimension anxieuse. Et en même temps, la résilience avec cette maladie chronique, parce qu'il faut apprendre à vivre avec une maladie chronique, diabète, hypertension, maladie cardiovasculaire, épilepsie ou autre, il faut apprendre à vivre avec, améliorer notre résilience, c'est là le rôle d'une bonne psychothérapie. Merci.